Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you will get when you include an ad from Podgo. Apply today and become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at p-o-d-g-o dot c-o. And be sure to add Casting Through Ancient Greece in How Did You Hear About the Podgo section of the application. Have you been enjoying the series and want to show your support in some way? You can visit www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the Support the Series button. Here you will find many ways you can help the series grow, from subscribing, getting involved in social media, and leaving reviews where you listen to your podcasts. Other options also include assisting with my Amazon wishlist for resources and supporting the series on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. The support I have been receiving so far has been fantastic. So a big thank you to everyone who has been helping me grow the series. Now on to the show, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, episode 34, Persia's Greek War, featuring Trevor Cully. When drafting the last episode, Persia and Defeat, I had the idea it would be nice to talk to someone with a deeper knowledge of the Persians, where I could follow many of the ideas a bit further. I ended up turning to another podcaster, Trevor Cully, who creates the podcast History of Persia. Trevor was more than happy to come on and talk about the Persians' experience during the Greek and Persian Wars. What made this great timing too, was that we were both releasing episodes that ran parallel to one another, obviously with myself focusing primarily on the Greek experience, and Trevor on the Persians. So it just made sense to get together and talk about the Greco-Persian Wars. So I hope you enjoyed the episode where Trevor was really able to give some clarity and great insights around Persia's experience in and around the Greek and Persian Wars. If you haven't yet, make sure to check out Trevor's podcast, History of Persia, available wherever you listen to your podcasts, and you can visit his website at www.historyofpersiapodcast.com. Also, just a quick note, I numbered the episode 33 in the interview, but as per my introduction here, the website and the feed, it is episode number 34 in the narrative. I just had not settled on the order of episodes at the time of recording. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the talk and the episode. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Selick and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, episode 33, Persia's Greek War, featuring Trevor Cully from the History of Persia podcast. I know over the last few episodes I've been threatening to finish our look at the Greek and Persian wars, but I've recently had the opportunity to connect with another podcaster who has a deeper knowledge of the Persians. Even though I looked at certain aspects of the Greek and Persian wars from our last episode, I thought today's guest could shed some more light and offer some more insights as we discuss Persia's motivations and experiences of the war. So I'd like to welcome to the show Trevor Cully, the creator and presenter of History of Persia podcast. Welcome, Trevor, and thanks for coming to the show to share some of your knowledge with us. Hi, thanks for having me on. Pleasure to be here. Good to hear. So I thought we could begin by you telling, telling us a bit about yourself and what got you into podcasting. Right. So uh, in relative terms, I'm kind of a late adapter to podcasting. I didn't really start listening to many podcasts until really just the year or so before I started making my own. Um, but the first podcast I listened to was actually Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, which I think is probably a common story among history podcast fans. Uh, I discovered it actually through a class in my freshman year of university. Uh, called Religion Without Borders. We studied the origins of different religions. And the TA recommended Dan Carlin's series on the Persian Empire when we covered Zoroastrianism, the religion of the ancient Persians. Uh, obviously, that struck a chord with me. That year, I ended up writing a term paper on Zoroastrianism and listening to the rest of Dan Carlin's stuff. Uh, and after a couple of years of still not really listening to podcasts, eventually bumped into the history of Rome from Mike Duncan. Uh, and like so many people who listen to that show, I was immediately wondering, is there a version of this for something else that I like? And started looking for the history of Persia. 
The closest thing at the time was the history of Iran from Kodad Rezakani, uh, but he had stopped after just about 10 episodes and just barely got into the time of Cyrus the Great and the start of the Persian Empire. And I found that kind of disappointing, but over that time I had also started listening to many, many other uh, history podcasts, more than I'll bother to list here. And eventually I said, well, I want to research Persia professionally, I want to go to grad school for that, so why don't I get some of that research out of the way and I'll do it myself. So I started researching it and then my computer broke and it actually delayed my ability to start the podcast by a few months. But in the long run, I think that helped because it left me with this huge pile of research by the time I actually got started with the recording and editing process. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I must admit, uh, Mike Duncan's Rome podcast is probably the first one I ever listened to. That was back, oh, I think it would have been before 2010. But um, I've also listened to Dan Carlin's. I think um, the first one I listened to his was the World War One version, and it was came across very dramatic. He's a very dramatic uh, storyteller too, so it's uh, very entertaining. Um, how, just how, how did you find, um, now I've gone, I went down the route of um, doing university with uh, history, but I found it started to zap away my enthusiasm for history and I kind of pulled back and that's what sort of motivated me to get in, getting into podcasting. How have you found the formal studies with podcasting? You know, there's actually been relatively little overlap uh, I finished my last year of undergraduate while I was starting the podcast and then uh, did one semester of grad school and then pulled out of that for complicated, non-related reasons. Uh, in general, though, I find I apply most of the same research tactics that I learned you know, through formal study to learning about Persia for the podcast, but I'm not bound by the particular writing styles and citation methods of a formal history paper when I'm doing this, which makes it both, I think, harder and easier to write about. I think when you have that kind of formal institutional training, it actually makes it harder to write a script if you're not able to just speak off the cuff really easily. Um, so it took a couple of rounds of practice before I could figure out how to just write down the way I would talk about something. Yeah, that's what I found. I guess um, the, the formal studies helps you with the critical th uh, thinking side of things and how to think about your sources. And um, I think, I guess, I guess with the university, you're, you're writing for other academics, whereas with podcasting, you're writing for, for everyone. You're, you're trying to connect with um, everyone and no matter what their, um, their level of understanding of your topic is. So now, obviously, your show is about Persia. Um, and it would, would it be fair to say that the uh, Persian episode on like Dan Carlin and that type of thing, that's what sort of led you to focus on the Persian history or were there, were there other factors that sort of got you down that yeah. path? Right. It's a bit of a combination of, you know, that King of Kings series that Dan Carlin did. And then that led me to be interested in the Persian Empire and to pursue that angle of things for that class I took. And in doing that, I wrote a, essentially a paper on the history of religion in the Persian Empire. And that's what kind of spurred me on to focus on that. And it was that, and I think my age has a little bit to do with it. You know, I was uh, not quite six yet when 9-11 happened and the U.S. got involved in the ongoing wars in the Middle East. So kind of growing up in the shadow of that, there's all this media uh, of, you know, the East versus West and, you know, putting anything out about the Greco-Persian Wars and the Crusades when I was a kid, you know, that was all over the place. And anybody who was interested in history was getting inundated with kind of those two stories. So when I went to college, I actually thought I was going to study the Crusades until I bumped into the history of ancient Persia and realized there was just so much material that nobody ever told me about. Uh, and it was much more interesting to study that as a kind of puzzle than it was to study these well-trodden paths of, you know, uh, 
Leonidas and Thucydides and going into the Crusades and doing, you know, round one, round two, round three of the same basic conflict over and over again. Whereas with Persia, you get kind of untold stories hiding beneath these really well-known narratives. Yeah, absolutely. That kind of leads me into, I guess, my next question I was going to look at with you was, um, well, first of all, we're, we're both, I guess, releasing episodes around the Greek and Persian Wars at the moment too, where um, I think uh, were you, the last one was around Salamis. Right, yeah, yeah, I did the aftermath of Salamis, uh, and I've got my episode on Plutea is going to come out this weekend, okay, right after well, we record this. Yep, well, I'm releasing my episode on uh, Macaulay, actually, uh, today, so or during the time of this recording. Um, anyway, so we're doing that at the moment, and a lot of the narrative purposes seems to come from Greek sources. So we, we draw a lot of the storytelling from what the Greeks were saying. And then we try and have to infer, I guess, uh, in part what the Persians were doing from those Greek sources. So with you focusing on the Persians, how, how have you um, drawn out a Persian narrative from what's told in say Herodotus or Diodorus or, or whatever else? Um, what other sources can you look to to piece together what they were, the Persians were doing during the Greek and Persian wars? So dealing with specifically the Greek and Persian wars for a Persian perspective is very difficult um, because the Persians themselves did not write very much about it at all. You know, there's barely even references to the fact that there were wars going on in Persian documents from the same time period. And that's almost surprising given that our largest collection of Persian documents comes from right around the time of the Persian Wars. The Persepolis Fortification Archive is this collection of thousands and thousands of clay cuneiform tablets from the Persian capital at Persepolis that comes from the middle of the reign of Darius and the beginning of the reign of Xerxes. So we'd expect to see something, and they're just barely references to some of the people involved. Uh, so otherwise, it requires a lot of kind of ignoring the most dramatic scenes from sources like Herodotus. You know, basically any time he gives dialogue to one of the Persian kings, it's probably entirely made up. And trying to guess, based on what we do know about other events in the Persian Empire, what might have motivated the Persians while they were in Greece. You know, particular things that are helpful from Herodotus's original narrative are figures like Artemisia or Thersander of Orchomenos, who seem to be very real people who Herodotus had access to as primary sources. And we can rely on those parts of Herodotus a little bit more because he's saying, here's a specific person who I had this specific access to who could tell these the stories of these events. Outside of that, there might be hints of how the Persians remembered the war with Greece from writers like Theseus, who was a Greek physician in the court of Artaxerxes II almost 100 years later. But he was known for writing with the most dramatic and gaudy or scandalous versions of Persian court history. And on top of that, most of Theseus's writing hasn't survived to the modern era, so he's a problematic source to begin with. Other than that, we have evidence of people like Mardonius, who the Persians called Mardunia, in the Persepolis archives. We have a tablet that talks about uh, him and his wife and his mother traveling somewhere in the empire. Uh, and we have the best, closest thing to a Persian source actually talking about the Persian Wars is a reference to Datis, the Median commander who led the attack on Marathon. Uh, there's a reference to him coming back from Ionia during the Ionian Revolt. Other than that, no Persian sources to speak of that could really help us understand what they were doing in Greece. Yes, it's. Um, I found it very difficult too. You sort of put up... Um you know, what ifs, maybe this could have been the case or that could have been the case when you try and suck out some of the drama that's told in the Greek sources. 
Um, now, I know you, you brought up um, this, the whole uh, East versus West sort of concept as well. And now that does, I guess, play out in our Greek sources, especially in Herodotus. We see it in the beginning of his work where he, he talks about how there was this almost like an eternal conflict that had existed between East and West back into mythological times. But um, I guess getting to the Greek and Persian wars, he then lays the blame for the war breaking out with the Athenians and the Eritreans deciding to go and help um, in the Ionian revolt and basically taking an active role on uh, Persian soil. Um, and then this is supposedly then what's led to the, the campaigns that went through um, Thrace and then uh, eventually to, to Marathon in 492 and 490. Um, do you see this as like the Athenians and Eritreans involvement in the Ionian revolt being the main point of Ver Persia's motivations for mounting this initial campaign or were there other factors at play as well? So the, yeah, you know, the thing that Herodotus portrays as the beginning of the Persian invasion of Greece and the thing that I would consider the Persian, the beginning of the Persian invasion of Greece are different events. Uh, Herodotus makes Mardonius's invasion of Thrace and Macedon in 492 out to be an attempt at invading all the way into Greece. But nothing about the story he actually tells bears that out. Mardonius gets there, he is wounded initially, but then they stick around for a few months and conquer or reconquer Thrace, which they had evidently lost contact with or lost control over during the Ionian Revolt. Then Mardonius goes back to Persia. There's no further advancement into Greece for a year, and Mardonius is evidently still highly placed. He's not punished, he's not regarded as a failure, he's put in charge of Xerxes' later invasion of Greece. It really seems like that event in 492 was an expedition to Thrace, not to Greece. 490, obviously a different story. It is obviously an invasion, but really of Athens, not Greece as a whole. Generally speaking, when you're trying to conquer a region, you don't invade right in the middle with powerful groups like Sparta to your south and Thebes to your north. It's clearly an attack on Athens. Obviously, there are some conquests in the Aegean Sea where they take over some islands on the way there. But Athens is a, the target, not necessarily the Greek mainland as a whole. And you know, comparing the size of the army described by Herodotus with Xerxes versus the size described at Marathon, even though he inflates his numbers, Marathon is obviously supposed to be a smaller force. So this is kind of a punitive expedition. And part of that, I think, is because they did have the gall to burn the provincial capital at Sardis, uh, at the beginning of the uh, Ionian Revolt. But I think part of it is probably also due to the fact that Athens was, from the Persian perspective, a state in rebellion. In 507, when the Spartans were bearing down on the newly reestablished Athenian democracy, Athens went to the Persian satrap Artaphernes, gave him the symbolic offering of earth and water, and essentially, those dignitaries that Athens sent surrendered Athenian territory to the Persian Empire. From the Persian perspective, the fact that they didn't follow through on that was just Athens going into rebellion, not actually anything to do with, uh, oh, you, you can't back out. You can't back out of surrendering your land to the great king. Uh, so that was probably the Persian perspective on that. Yeah, so it's kind of like an extension of um, the Ionian Revolt, I guess. They've put much of Ionia back under control. Now it's time to mount separate campaigns to re-establish their authority in, in Thrace and Macedon. And then I guess it's later is then trying to punish those other cities that Persia had seen to be acting against them, even though they were supposed to have submitted to them. Very much so, I think. Um... Yeah, you know, there's not a break in time between the invasion of Attica 
and the Battle of Marathon and the rest of the Ionian Revolt. It's very much one continuous series of events from the outbreak of hostilities in 499 to the Battle of Marathon in 490. There's consistent warfare between Greeks and Persians through that entire period. Yes, and I find it's it's almost um, I find it interesting how Herodotus uh, portrays that that event with the Athenians going to seek um, aid from Persia um, when they were trying to strengthen themselves against the Spartans, almost as if the the uh, delegation that was sent were agreeing to something something they didn't even realize uh, the the gravity of it because when they returned to Athens, they were um, supposedly rebuked and um, I guess. Athens at that stage didn't didn't consider themselves a subject city, but um, now obviously, like we said, it um, this brought us to the Battle of Marathon, and like as you said, um, the the Greek sources do like to inflate the uh, the figures. I think sort of modern estimates perhaps put um, the expedition like upwards of maybe twenty five thousand. Um, troops may have been involved from the Persian side that ended up coming across the Aegean. Um, now, obviously, they, the Persians didn't take Athens. They were forced back into the empire. Now, the Athenians presented this as quite a um, monumental victory. It came to define a, a whole sort of generation known as the, the Marathon Men. It was, I guess, similar to you know how we how veterans of World War Two were were celebrated as being um, like a golden generation of heroes. Um, now, obviously, what did this mean for um, Persia? I mean, it was quite a monumental victory in, in the Athenians' eyes, but was the, the defeat much of a... How much did it affect the empire? From the Persian perspective, there's basically no fallout. You know, Ionia is back under control. The Persian presence in Thrace and Macedon was actually stronger than ever before. Um, and it doesn't seem that anybody was punished for this. You know, it, nobody was regarded as a horrible failure in the aftermath. Uh, Datis, who I mentioned before, um, he apparently maintained contacts in Athens. Uh, one of the uh, opponents of, uh, Themis of Themistocles was Aristides. And he was accused of being a brother of Datis. Um, like that was an early form of Medizing in the, in the Athenian vocabulary. Uh, and then Datis' sons were Xerxes' cavalry commanders during the initial invasion of Greece. And his co-commander, Artaphernes II, succeeded his father as the satrap in Lydia. And he was also one of the commanders in Greece when Xerxes invaded again in 480. Nobody seems to have been punished in any meaningful way for the failure at Marathon. The biggest shift, as far as we can tell from the sources that exist, is that Darius did plan to launch a full-fledged invasion of Greece to subdue the peninsula uh, towards the end of his reign. Um, an event that was cut short when Darius died and uh, de then delayed because Xerxes had to take the army that he had built up and use it to put down rebellions in the first couple years of his reign. So that's why there wasn't more immediate turnaround after Marathon. Um, and it's probably one of the saving graces for Greece that Darius died when he did. Yes, and I think seeing, I guess, these plans put on hold uh, because of other troubles within the empire sort of shows, I guess, the the importance of uh, the campaign that had been mounted west. It kind of took a back seat. It was a secondary importance to the regions that Persia already controlled. So it seemed like it's more about keep everything they already own under control before venturing out to, to do anything uh, new. Right. There's very much an element of a tie between... Uh, military prowess and success in Persian kingship, especially early Persian kingship. Um, but you couldn't let anybody who you already ruled get away, especially one of those uh, rebellions at the start of Xerxes' reign was in Babylon, right at the heart of the Persian Empire. Um, and that couldn't be allowed to stand because 
you can't have you can't mount an invasion of some foreign country while the middle of your own empire is splitting in two. Um, so it was very much a distraction that had to be dealt with before Xerxes could plan to do anything else. But then when you get around to Xerxes actually mounting the invasion, the ability to conquer new territory had been paramount to Persian kingship up to this point. Obviously, you have Cyrus the Great, who built the empire from the ground up, um, and Cambyses, who conquered most of the eastern islands of the Aegean and Egypt. Um, and then you get into Darius, who added bits of India and uh, places like Thrace and Macedon. So Xerxes had all of this heritage of adding new territory, and it was kind of expected of him that he would add new territory too once he took the throne. So there were already plans for invading Greece, there was already reasons in Akasus Belli for invading Greece, so it was only natural that Xerxes would say, well, the thing I'm going to add first will be Greece. Um, and that's where you end up in 480 when he sets out to do that invasion. Yep. And um, obviously, yeah, you, you, you want to keep your, um, your possessions you already own under control. If they break out in revolt and you, you let it take place, it's just going to encourage other areas that you control to also break out and create a chain reaction for you. Um, so this now gets into the next part I was going to talk to you about, and that was um, the, the planning behind the, the second invasion. Obviously, you alluded to that um, Darius was looking at mounting a second expedition towards Greece that was focused on taking over the whole, all the lands. Now, do you think, and then obviously now Xerxes is, is uh, left with that responsibility, do you think the failure at Marathon is the largest or the, the main motivation to launching this campaign? Or do you think it was always sort of on the cards? Like you say, you know, Persia had a policy of um, expanding. Is it possible that um, the the initial campaign under under uh, Darius was kind of uh, laying some groundwork with a smaller force and then a policy of expansionism would then follow? Uh, I think there's certainly a possibility of that, and I think all of it can probably be tied into some economic motivations. You have, you know, there's, Greece is not essential to Persian control, certainly not the Greek mainland. Um, there's more to be said for the cities in Ionia on the actual Persian coastline. Um, but they controlled most of the trade in the eastern Mediterranean. You know, they have Libya, they have Egypt, they have Phoenicia, they have uh, the coast of Anatolia. So Greece is really this kind of missing puzzle piece. On the northern side of the Mediterranean, path, once you get past Greece, you get into areas that aren't heavily urbanized, that don't have a lot of international trade. So Greece is kind of the last frontier of independent, uh, well-organized, and wealthy merchants and seaborne trade in the Mediterranean, the Black Sea. And they're the only piece of the puzzle that the Persians don't get to tax. You know, at this point, they have presence in the Black Sea. They have possible presence in the Crimea. That's up for a lot of debate. And they have presence all the way around the Aegean. So there's, and Darius had made an intentional point of conquering all of the islands between Anatolia and Greece during that campaign where they attacked Macedon or where they attacked Marathon. So there does seem to be an obvious economic goal in controlling Greece and saying, there we go, we have a complete monopoly over Mediterranean trade. Yeah, and so it, I guess in part it's kind of uh, economic and, and the prestige um, factor is also playing at, at play because Obviously, a new king, he's expected to expand the, the empire somewhat to follow in his predecessor's footsteps. Exactly. Uh, and really, when you look out in all other directions, uh, so far as we know from the limited sources we have, there's really nowhere of extreme value other than Greece um, immediately on the periphery of the empire. 
there's kind of a gap in northern India between where the Persian border theoretically is somewhere around the Indus River and the next set of powerful wealthy kingdoms. So Greece is the last thing on the immediate borders that is urbanized and organized and wealthy. Uh, so it, it makes for a very obvious target. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess getting into the, um, the second invasion, um, I know Herodotus, what's he put the numbers at uh, over 2 million fighting men. It's meant to have invaded Greece. But I think, um, w w I mean, what would you th uh, think is a reasonable number? I mean, I've heard upwards of maybe 200,000 um, troops were deployed against Greece for the second invasion. What do you think was a realistic? 200,000 seems like just about the absolute maximum. Yeah. Um, Two million would be approximately 2% of the global population at the time, um, and would be about one in every 20 people from the Persian Empire, period. Not just men, not just adults. One in 20 of every single human being in the empire getting up and attacking Greece. That's obviously completely unrealistic. Um, even 200,000 would make it one of, if not the largest army ever assembled at the, in the world at that point. Um, but it does, it was certainly possible. This was the height of Persian territory and Persian population um, and really Persian military power. Kings after Xerxes kind of shift their priorities around. So if anybody up to this point in history was going to organize a 200,000 man army, it was going to be Xerxes. Um, and the numbers that Herodotus describes on the Greek side kind of bear out just how large this army ultimately was. Hello everyone, Mark here, just taking a quick time out to give you a podcast recommendation. If you've been enjoying my series, you may also enjoy Ancient History Hound, but I'll let Neil tell you more. Are you someone who is interested in ancient history? Perhaps you're someone new to it all. Alternatively, you might be someone who's studied or read a bit about it. Or maybe you're in between. Whatever your interest level or how much you know, the Ancient History Hound podcast could be the podcast for you. Hi, my name's Neil, and as you've probably guessed, I'm the host. I love ancient history. I studied it at uni many, many years ago. In fact, back then it was called Current Affairs. My podcast is all about finding interesting areas of ancient history and talking about it. I sometimes have guests and there's a variety of topics you can check for yourself. Just use the platform you get your podcasts on and have a look. I reckon there'll be something you want to listen to. The next time you have a few minutes, why not check out the Ancient History Hound podcast? It will be great to have you join me. Now, obviously, um, the march into Greece was, um, I don't think we need to go too much into the uh, Battle of uh, Thermopylae. Obviously, that was, I guess, I feel a lot of the um, the air around the, the Greeks uh, celebrating that victory was more in hindsight after the battle, more than what the battle itself represented at the time. I think it became a, a much larger role in, in perhaps uh, future battles and wars that they would call upon that. But um, eventually, obviously, after, after I think seven days outside Thermopylae, um, Xerxes would break through into central Greece and finally capture Athens and was burnt to the ground. And this would then lead to the Battle of Salamis. And um, obviously, oh, sorry, the fleet also engaged at Artemisium not far from Thermopylae and the Greeks withdrew. And the next battle would happen at Salamis. And now the Greek fleet were able to, to win a victory at Salamis as well. And we hear that this victory is supposed to have um, justified Xerxes' departure from Greece at the time. Now, do you think the defeat at Salamis was a major factor in Xerxes' return to Persia, or were there other reasons at play that were could explain him leaving the army in Greece while he returned? You know, I think it's been popular in especially recent years to downplay the importance of the Greek wars for Persia and downplay any defeats at the hands of Greeks as, oh, well, they, it was just kind of this provincial thing. But no, Salome, even from the 
information we can get out of Herodotus was an unmitigated naval disaster for the Persians. Um, working off of Herodotus's numbers and what we actually think Persian territory was capable of producing, Salome started with somewhere between four and six hundred ships. And the next time we hear about the Persian Navy is at Nicale, and there's 300. Um, and that's, you know, those are the num or 300 is the number quoted by Herodotus. So either that's realistic or it's inflated, but it's certainly not going to be smaller than reality. Um, so the Persian Navy lost potentially as many as half or more of its total strength in the Straits of Salome. Um, and there's no way to deny that that had an impact on the rest of the war. Was that the only thing that led Xerxes to personally leave? It's hard to say, um, but he definitely seems to have been panicked about something. You know, he, it causes the immediate turnaround of most of the Persian army. Uh, he leaves behind maybe as few as 30,000 actual Persians uh, to be supplemented by the Greeks who have allied themselves with Persia and everyone goes home. Um, one particular story that I think stands out is that Xerxes had a couple of his illegitimate sons with him in Greece, uh, and he immediately puts them on a ship with Artemisia of Halicarnassus and sends them back to Ephesus with the fleet ahead of the rest of the army. Um, in his kind of tirade against Herodotus, uh, that he calls literally the malice of Herodotus, the Roman historian Plutarch kind of uses this in ex as an example of where Herodotus gets things wrong and says, well, obviously Xerxes would have had servants to take care of his children from Persia, but that's not what Herodotus is describing. He describes Xerxes having sons with him. He doesn't say anything about them being kids. They're just his sons. And what we know about Xerxes' legitimate sons and how old Xerxes is at the time, these are probably young men getting their first taste of military command. And Xerxes is worried enough about the situation that he not only doesn't let them stay in Greece, but he sends them home as fast as he possibly can. So there's definitely something going on where Xerxes feels like his own flesh and blood, who are potentially his oldest adults and only adult sons, so potentially, you know, people of extreme political importance to his empire need to get out of that situation as fast as possible. That said, there are a couple of other possibilities of what was going on that might have motivated him to pull as many troops out as he did. Um, one thing I speculate about in my podcast is that this campaign had just gone on for longer than it was supposed to, um, that they thought the Greek invasion wouldn't take nearly as long as it did, and uh, for logistical reasons, they didn't have the supplies to keep everybody there, so they had to pull a significant amount of the troops out and Xerxes decided to go back because he didn't want to leave the empire unattended for too long. The last king before Xerxes to be away for as long as he was was Cambyses and Cambyses was overthrown by his brother who was overthrown by Darius and prompted a uh, six-pronged civil war that encompassed the empire for almost five years. So Xerxes had a lot of reason not to stay away for too long and to pass things off to a sub-commander at some point. Yeah, so he may have, may have been mindful of what had taken place previously and saw that if you were absent from the empire for too long, you, you ran the risk of, I guess, pretenders coming up to try and take power or, or uh, other people taking over wealthy parts of the empire. Um, now, one thing I've read, um, I wonder if you could shed some more more light on this, was you know, we spoke about how before Xerxes launched his campaign, Babylon had gone into revolt. Um, I've also heard that there's, there was possibly two revolts that had taken place. There was the one before the second invasion, and it's thought there may have been something happening around um, the 479 period, which may have also... Um, I guess, motivated Xerxes to head back home. Have you read much into, into that? So yeah, I actually did an interview episode on my own podcast with a PhD candidate from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands uh, named Zume Wijnsma, 
And she is a specialist in these events, exactly, actually, um, in the revolts at the beginning of Xerxes' reign. Uh, and in her opinion, we probably shouldn't consider 479 as a realistic possibility. Um, there's a lot of evidence in Babylonian archives for some kind of cataclysmic shift in local elites around 486, but nothing comparable in 479. Um, the 479 date is based on how we take a guess at the different years uh, that these rebellions might have happened. The Persians dated their documents based on how many years into the reign of each king they were on. So if there's a gap or if there's a year in an archive where there isn't any reference to the first year under Xerxes or the seventh year under Xerxes, then that's a potential for where one of these other kings or these pretender kings might have been in charge because that year would have been recorded as the first year under Belshimani or something like that. Um, so we have, we have to just guess based on which dates we have missing from the archives, but there's actually seven years that are possible. It's just that 479 gets the most attention because it coincides with the invasion of Greece. Um, in the opinion of most of the specialists on these events that I've referenced, uh, we should really stick to the 486 date. That's not to say that there couldn't have been something else going on in the empire. Um, one of the most interesting royal inscriptions that Xerxes left behind is one called Inscription XPH. Um, so that's one of his inscriptions at Persepolis, it's better known by the nickname the Diva Inscription. And it is the first uh, royal inscription to mention a couple of groups who have never appeared in Persian sources before. Um, at the, it was customary for the Persian kings to always list all of the territory under their control at the beginning of each inscription. And Xerxes mentions a group called the Akafakia and another group called the Dahai. And the Dahai would eventually become very important because uh, that's where the founders of the Parthian Empire eventually came from. Um, and these are two groups that have never appeared in a Persian record before. So at some point, those two groups were added to the empire. We don't have any more detail about it, but that could have been something Xerxes was doing at some later point in his reign. Okay, yeah, so the, perhaps we've got a combination of uh, Greece is not going entirely to plan. It's taking longer than, than he thought. Got to get back to the empire. I don't want to allow any um, troubles to take place with his absence. But then there was also perhaps other campaigns that had been planned that were also unfolding at the time, which needed his attention, perhaps. Yeah, other campaigns that have been planned or, you know, both of these groups are on kind of the periphery of the empire. Um, and the inscription itself talks about a, re a different rebellion by a group that worshipped uh, gods that Xerxes refers to as Daiba, which is a very detailed theological concept from Zoroastrian religion, but basically is uh, gods that the uh, Zoroastrian, or you know, at least whatever you could really characterize Xerxes as, the ruling class of Persia would have considered false gods. Um, and that would could apply to anybody in uh, Eastern Iran or India or Central Asia, somewhere in that area. So you have these three groups and reference to a rebellion somewhere in the Eastern Empire, uh, but we don't have a ton of detail to explain what exactly that might have been. Hmm. Actually, you, you're bringing that up just um, just makes me wonder about, uh, I guess, with, with the religion that you talk about, um, how the past kings were well known for, I guess, allowing populations to live their lives, worship the gods that they worshipped, as long as they were um, abiding by you know, paying tribute providing troops to the empire, they were allowed to sort of govern themselves to some degree. And I have um, read parts where perhaps Xerxes was a bit more, uh, I guess, pushing the whole Zoroastrian side of things where he placed more of an importance on religion. Is that an aspect that happens under him where populations are, are more encouraged to follow that type of religion or were they still allowed to basically 
allowed to worship the gods that they they had originally done so. Uh, so this inscription that I'm talking about is basically the whole basis for that aspect of Xerxes. Um, it's a combination of that and several sources mention him taking the cult statue from the sanctuary of the chief Babylonian guard Marduk. Um, but there's a lot of political issues tied up in that. Uh, the coronation ritual of the Babylonian king involved annually taking the hand of that statue of Marduk, um, and Xerxes dropped the king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, titles from his royal titulary. So by taking away that statue, it was more an announcement of Babylon's place in the empire, not really anything actually religious. So that leaves um, basically one paragraph describing one rebellion as the basis for portraying Xerxes as some kind of religious zealot. Um, and that doesn't really support that idea. Um, there is an interesting phenomenon in the history of the Persian Empire where groups that the Persian kings considered to be Iranian, or you know, to use the word they would have used, Aryan, which is obviously a word with a lot of baggage, uh, they were expected to worship the Persian gods, or more accurately, worship the uh, supreme Zoroastrian god, Ahura Mazda, and so far as we can tell based on this inscription from Xerxes, to not worship the daiva, the ones they considered false gods. Um, so in Darius the Great's Behistun inscription, uh, which is the story of his rise to power in the civil wars that followed, he condemns, uh, Scythians from Central Asia and Elamites for not worshiping, uh, the primary god, Ahura Mazda, but he doesn't make that accusation at anybody else. And we know for certain that nobody in Egypt and nobody in Babylon or Nobody in Armenia was going to be worshipping Ahura Mazda at this point. But these specifically Iranian groups do get that accusation. So it seems to be kind of an ethnic requirement, not something that anybody ever tried to enforce over the entire empire. Yep, and I, I think um, from, from my reading as well, you get, uh, with all the, the accusations leveled at Xerxes, I think it becomes it's more of the fact that he was, I guess, the boogeyman to Greece at the time. That was the, the largest invasion that had been directed at Greece. Athens had been captured and whatever. So uh, a lot of uh, negative, um, I guess, stories were, were going to come out about Xerxes and trying to portray him in, a, I guess, more of a, a tyrannical sort of light just because of um, his, his invasion towards Greece. Um, I guess I want to get to why, well, fast forward, so obviously we've had, um, the Salamis taken place, Xerxes has gone back with much of his forces, and then, uh, Mardonius has left in Greece with a, we're told, a picked force, and obviously the, the Greeks that were allied, uh, took to the Persians. Now, and then we had the, eventually, I won't get, get too much into it, but we had the, the, the Greeks, uh, I guess for near, near on a year, couldn't decide to come together again to, um, to try and challenge Persia. But eventually we had the Battle of Plataea take place where um, I guess it's hard not to read that that was a uh, bit of a disaster for Mardonius that had taken place there. And then obviously tradition had it that um, Macale on the Anatolian coast, there was also a Greek victory over there. Now, what I want to, sort of look at is what were some of the key factors to um in these battles say Salamis um and even some of the land battles like Marathon and and Plataea what what do you think led to their their defeats at those places was there I mean you hear lots of aspects like there was a military inferiority um perhaps numbers were at play um those types of things what what do you think um Perhaps we could start with Salamis. What do you think was the major contributor to a, a defeat on the waters there? At Salami, I think you can mostly attribute it to uh, the geography and Greeks fighting on there with a home field advantage. Um, you know, we have multiple instances in the 
you know, the stories of the Persian Navy up to that point, you know, rounding Mount Athos or uh, sitting off the coast of Artemisium or trying to go around Euboea to sneak up on the Greeks, of the Persians not being familiar enough with Greek waters to know what to avoid uh, and getting completely destroyed because of it. Um, you know, multiple times they're wrecked in storms or wrecked by shallow waters. This is a recurring theme in Herodotus' story of the Persian invasion. Uh, so then you get it to Salome, where the Greeks manage to lure them into this really narrow strait where the whole Persian fleet sa apparently sails in, and the Greeks are there too, and you have you know, maybe a kilometer between the tip of Salome and the coast of Attica. So there's not a lot of room for almost 900 ships to negotiate the waters there. So when things start going wrong for the first couple waves of the Persian fleet, they turn around and they try to flee, but there's, they just get bottlenecked into their own ships. Uh, and they are crashing into one another. We have you know, multiple stories of Persian ships crashing into one another, ramming and getting under one another in the fighting, crews capturing one another's ships, um, and of course the story of Artemisia being chased by a Greek ship until she rams a Persian ship on purpose. So these very congested waters put the Persians' numbers at a complete geographical di disadvantage, and by the time any of the ships are able to force their way out of the Strait of Salome, they're not trying to fight anymore, they're not expecting there to be any Greeks on the outside, and you have a few dozen ships from Aegina floating off the coast, waiting to ambush them on their way out while they're already damaged and exhausted. So it just becomes this bloodbath in the straits with that very narrow passage. Um, and I think it's just a matter of the Persian fleet not knowing enough about the coast of mainland Greece. Yeah, it's a bit of a home field advantage. And I guess then by going into the straits there too, they're their numbers, their greater numbers now become a detriment to themselves because obviously yeah, you, you've got people retreating, but there's no room for maneuver anymore. Exactly. Um, now, the other thing is, well, I'll move on to say some of the, the land battles because I feel one of the, the Persians' greatest assets was uh, their cavalry force. Um, I, I guess that's when the, the Greeks were defeated at uh, Ephesus, it, it seems to me that the main reason that the Persians caught up to them at the force was because they had uh, faster troops, perhaps their cavalry was deployed against them and they defeated them soundly in quite open terrain. And then we also hear at Marathon, the intention was to bring cavalry uh, to Marathon. And that was supposedly one of the main reasons that that place was chosen to land the Persian forces. Now, we don't hear much about the cavalry and there's lots of uh, theories that revolve around that with Marathon. But I think the only place we, we really hear about the Persian cavalry playing any sort of role is at um, Plataea. Um, do you think they just did not have the chance to deploy their cavalry in, in all the other battles that took place? Well, in the, you know, the battles that we hear about, yeah. It wasn't an issue with Thermopylae. They were able to win at Thermopylae, and that wasn't great geography for cavalry in the first place. Yep. Um, they seem to have you know, savaged their way through the terrain between Boeotia and Attica perfectly fine with cavalry. Um, and they were used in light raids against Megara and then against the Persian encampment at Plataea a few times. And in the descriptions of the fighting immediately before the big battle at Plataea, the cavalry are extremely effective. You know, they pin down the Greeks with arrow and javelin uh, to the point that the only time the Greeks have a chance to attack anybody on the Persian side is when the cavalry turn away to come in for a, a bigger charge. Um, when we get to the big battle at Plataea, we hear about Mardonius riding back and forth with his uh, cream of the crop, thousand man cavalry, reinforcing the line at different points. But a lot of the story at Plataea is taken up by 
the story of the Spartans engaging with the Persian light infantry. And it's portrayed as this event where the force of Spartan and Greek arms and armor are completely overwhelming to these poorly prepared, poorly organized, and poorly equipped Persians. And Herodotus donates a huge chunk of the Battle of Plataea to that specific part of the engagement. Well, these are, you know, the Persians had experience with heavy infantry like Greek hoplites before. It wasn't an issue for them fighting on Cyprus or fighting against the Ionian Greeks. Uh, the Phoenicians were also known to use hoplite-style soldiers and their armies. So the Persians knew how to deal with this. They had troops in their own army who would have been deployed against those groups in other situations. We just happen to hear a lot about this one instance of Persian light infantry, which are really just archers, being attacked by a f the full Spartan army. It's really not a fair competition. These are not troops that were ever designed to fight or you know, ever intended to fight against a heavy infantry charge. Um, but it's a really impressive and massive victory for the Spartans. And it's not necessarily as interesting to Herodotus's audience and you know, some of his goals of writing closer to the time of the Peloponnesian War to talk about the fact that most of the Persian army at Plataea was Greeks. You know, it was, according to Herodotus, 50,000 uh, Greek hoplites from the cities that had sided with the Persians made up the bulk of the Persian line. So, and he j just references that the Athenians and the Thebans were locked together for most of the battle, and the rest of the Greeks on both sides spent time going back and forth from retreats to charges to retreats to charges. So I think that we have a really skewed picture of how the Battle of Plataea actually played out. Um, but one of the deciding factors, according to Herodotus, was that Mardonius died, and that caused the Persians around him to retreat. Um, and part of the Persian army never engaged in the first place. That's the part under Artabazos that Herodotus says was hanging back because Artabazos wanted Mardonius to fail. It's also entirely possible that they were just hanging back to be a rear line to come in as reinforcements later. And Artabazos made the call that they had lost and they weren't going to gain the battlefield back, so they left. Um, and then there's this line that uh, Herodotus says that the, the Persians were the best of the army and everybody else was relying on them. So when the Persians retreated, everybody else retreated with them. But I don't think that makes a ton of sense. The Persians were the reason that anybody was fighting this war in the first place. So if the Persians uh, had either retreated or fled the battlefield entirely, or if your Mardonius got entrampled underneath of a bunch of horses, then why would the Greek infantry that was also there stick around? So everybody retreats uh, and, and gets themselves trapped in their own fortifications. So when the Greeks get into that, it's this big bottleneck of people who have already retreated and are already kind of giving up. And that's where you get the real bloodbath at Plataea, so far as you know, I can tell from the sources, is it's really when everybody gets trapped inside the fortifications. It seems to be a common theme with a lot of the land battles is, uh, I think it's uh, across almost all ancient battles is, once you break the morale of the army, like relatively, you know, light casualties generally take place once the forces are opposing each other, but it's during the rout that um, the bloodbath really begins. And once, I guess, uh, any semblance of sort of uh, resist resistance has, uh, has disappeared. So do you think Mardonius's death there is one factor that sort of would see the, the Persians decide to, to quit back to their palisade? I think it is. And I think part of it is because Herodotus describes him riding around, moving from point to point. Yeah. So if he was coordinating back and forth across the whole battle line and providing reinforcements as needed, then all of a sudden this key piece of the Persian strategy vanishes. You know, especially with Artabazos not engaged in the battle, there's no one to take up those reins and 
you know, any kind of coordinated strategy starts to fall apart. Yeah. Um, and I think another thing to note is that from what we can tell from the stories Herodotus tells about Artabazos, he was probably the commander of the Persian, Persian forces, you know, uh, whether or not it's, he was in charge of the immortals as coined by Herodotus or just, you know, some other prestigious or important Persian group. He is in charge of the people who had to accompany Xerxes back to Asia and then come home or then come back to Greece after Xerxes was safe. So he's in charge of people who were in charge of protecting the king at first. So if these are the leading Persians or the most prestigious Persians in the army, and they all leave, you know, there's not a lot left of the, either the command structure or at least the motivation to support a Persian attack, you know, if the Persian occupying force runs away. Yeah, I was, and well, I was actually going to ask you if you thought the uh, immortals were actually on the field of Plataea or had they returned with the Xerxes or perhaps maybe a portion stayed behind or? So, like I said, Artabazos, his story is that he's in Greece with the main army and then goes back with Xerxes and then comes back and attempts to put down a, a rebellion that he discovers in Thrace along the way, but doesn't have the siege equipment to deal with a city. So he has to give up if he wants to meet Mardonius in time for spring. But the fact that he had to accompany Xerxes, you know, suggests that he had some kind of role as one of the royal spear bearers or a bodyguard or something like that. So he's in charge of maybe 10,000 men on that journey to and from, and then Herodotus says 40,000 at Plataea, but who knows what the actual number was. Um, so he's in charge of somebody prestigious, whether or not it's the immortals specifically, if that's even a, a designation that the Persians would have recognized in their own army. Um, he, there is some important group under Artabazos' command, and I think that probably influences how much his retreat has an impact on the people on the ground. Yeah, and I mean, I, I don't fully buy the whole Herodotus, Herodotus um, putting Artabazos is the the bad guy in constant conflict with Mardonius. I think he's. I feel like he's acting more in pragmatic terms when it comes to pulling back from Plataea, and it would make sense that, I guess, a lot of armies in their reserves they tend they tend to have, um, I guess, the cream of the crop of the army sitting in reserve too. So it would make sense for him to have, uh, I guess, perhaps like we'll just call them immortals for now because of the how the Greeks uh, talk about them. But I think. It's, you know, it's the same as like, you know, the Praetorian Guard or whatever. It's like the elite forces of, of the army that would be generally left in reserve. Exactly. Uh, I think another thing to note is that when you get into the numbers and how Herodotus exaggerates them, you know, it's harder to estimate, but based on the size of the camp that Herodotus describes, uh, modern, a couple of modern historians estimate that the Persian army was probably no bigger than 120,000. And he's working with much better Greek numbers. So the Greek army is placed at somewhere around maybe 80,000. So these are not, there's not a huge disparity. And on top of that, Artabazos's group isn't engaged in the fighting. So there's probably not a huge numerical difference between the Persians and the Greeks at Plataea. Um, and probably not even a huge difference in the number of heavy infantry versus light infantry. You know, it's the biggest difference is cavalry, but these aren't mount, you know, these aren't knights. These are mounted archers for the most part. So they're not playing a huge role in the hand-to-hand -hand engagement. It's generally more harassing tactics, which you sort of see leading up to the actual engagement on the day of exactly. the Exactly. Yeah. Yes, it's... Um, and one thing that you did touch on already, which I wanted to maybe press you a bit more on, was um, the whole, I mean, you said that the Persians had encountered uh, the Greek style of warfare before. And I was wondering how much of maybe was this uh, a factor in, in their defeat on land? Had they adapted to fighting like a phalanx type formation or were they, they much... Uh, 
a lot more used to fighting how they do in their own lands when they're putting down revolts um, against troops that were sort of similar, would fight in a similar manner to themselves. What do you think they had enough time to adapt to the Greek way of fighting from their other experiences? So it's certainly not a foreign concept. Um, like I said, even the Phoenicians who don't get as much attention from ancient warfare specialists as they probably should, they also were depicted in ancient art as fighting in hoplite style. So these are, you know, this is a troop style that has been on both sides of Persian battlefields at different points. Um, you probably wouldn't have seen as much heavy infantry fighting on either side of a battle in, uh, you know, Central Asia or in Babylon or Egypt, just because the local troops that would have been assembled by whoever the Persians were fighting didn't fight in that style. But the Persians were certainly familiar with it and probably knew enough to deploy, you know, similar hoplite style troops against the Greek hoplites, whatever possible. That's part of the reason Mardonius would have called up so many Greek levies at the time. Um, and we see things like really successful use of cavalry uh, archers to harass and pin down Greek hoplites before the fighting starts. Um, so it's not something that they were unfamiliar with or was entirely alien, but they hadn't really come up with specific tactics for fighting against mass heavy infantry. Now, it was a component of Near Eastern armies, but not the primary force of any army in the way it was in Greece. Because in the Middle East, you have a lot more open plain, a lot more room for cavalry, a lot uh, stronger of a tradition of archery. So there's more mixed unit tactics on the average ancient Middle Eastern battlefield. Um, so I think there probably is a factor of overwhelming uh, heavy infantry usage in Greece that does play a role in it. Uh, but you don't see any specific adaptations to fight that up to this point. After this, you know, in the century or so following, you do see adaptations, um, not necessarily driven specifically by the wars in Greece, though continued exposure to the Greeks does lead to more phalanx-style formations and longer spears in Persian armies by the time Alexander's sources are describing them, but also you see the development of things like heavy cavalry. And the idea of someone in head-to-toe armor with a big, heavy spear that can charge on a horseback is something that develops during the period after the Greek Wars. And that's not necessarily exclusive to combating Greeks, but it is definitely something that was influenced by it. Yeah, I think um, I wonder, too, if it was more of a, a combination of fighting these larger massed formations, but also within the context of uh, the Greek geography as well, because it was definitely much more closed in uh, a closed in environment, which wouldn't allow for as much maneuvering for a, I guess, a more combined arm, um, mobile sort of type army as well. Right. Uh, you know, and Herodotus describes this kind of back and forth where the Greeks are trying to draw more Persian forces up into the hills, and the Persians are trying to get, convince the Greeks to come down into the plain in front of Plataea. Um, in the build-up to the battle. Um, and one of the thing that actually provokes the Persian attack, according to Herodotus, was Mardonius thought the Greeks were retreating when they were actually just moving to higher ground. Um, so part of it, uh, the defeat too, is that Mardonius wasn't prepared for a full, for a prepared Greek enemy. He thought he was charging into an army in retreat that actually just kind of turned a little bit. Uh, so that might explain part of why he didn't attack with his full force or why their tactics at Plataea don't make as much sense as they might have. And then we have an instance where I want to say the cavalry from Thebes is chased up into the hills behind Plataea by the Corinthians uh, as the Persian battle line starts to fall apart. And they chase the horsemen up into the hills where they can't maneuver as well, and that's how they defeat uh, that 
cavalry squadron is by breaking them up on rough terrain. Yeah, even though I guess that's one sort of um, picture within the Battle of Plataea that's hard to sort of tease out. You hear that um, the centre tried coming down and they were, I guess, somewhat slaughtered by the, the cavalry initially. But then once they get into that ground, it's the cavalry's broken up and can't play as much of a role, um, especially against the, I think it was the, 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 the Athenian um, left that was against the uh, the other Greek hoplites, where that, that sort of advantage that perhaps um, the Greeks allied to Persia had with the cavalry around was no longer present. And that may have also led to that collapse of that side. So, all right. Well, I think what we might do is just, we might finish things up, but we'll look at what did the overall picture of um, the defeat at, at Plataea and Mikali have on the Persians themselves? What, with them, well, I'm assuming the, um, the objective was to subjugate most of Greece in this, in this invasion. Would you agree that that was one of their primary motivations or objectives within this campaign? Yes, I think the initial plan was probably to subjugate all of Greece. Um, and when things started getting held up and moving slower, um, it kind of seems like Xerxes left Mardonius behind to consolidate power and take at least everything down to Attica, if not everything up to the Peloponnese and kind of create this new border with the Peloponnesian League centered on Sparta. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page with that. Um, with with um, Persia not um, achieving these objectives, what did this, did this have more an effect on the Persian Empire than say the, the, the defeat at Marathon 10 years earlier? Was this much, uh, a larger fallout for the Persians? I guess we'll look in the immediate aftermath, what did it mean for Persia? All right. Uh, so in the immediate aftermath, it was definitely more effective than Marathon, but it was still comparatively mild to you know, some of the events that would happen as the cascading effects. Uh, the biggest loss was probably um, with the destruction of the Persian navy, especially after Mikale, they lost control of the islands of the Aegean. Even the islands immediately off their coastline, like Lesbos and uh, Samos, were able to declare nominal independence. Now they ended up kind of subjugated to Athens, but that's a different issue. Um, the biggest territorial loss was in Thrace, where there had already been unrest up to that point. There's the um, rebellions that Artabazos encountered on his way back to Greece, and then there was another city in revolt that they passed by, that the Persian army passed by and didn't deal with on the initial retreat from Greece while Xerxes was still in charge. Um, so Thrace and Macedon basically completely fall away from Persian control. Um, at, and they had never been really firmly held in the first place. So it's not surprising that a big defeat in the region let them break away. Um, that said, a few cities like uh, the city of Aeon and the city of Sestos managed to remain under Persian control for a few more years before um, the counteroffensive led by Athens eventually forced Persia out of eight, or out of Europe altogether. Um, but those were the big territorial shifts. Um, the you know immediate Greek counteroffensive after Macale. Um, I don't know if you'll have talked about Sestos in Byzantium by the time this is coming out, um, but. Those two Greek victories uh, after Macale gave them control over the Hellespont and broke the Persian monopoly over Black Sea trade, which was another uh, major loss. And that's kind of the theme of the losses in the immediate aftermath, is they're all kind of economic. The Black Sea gets opened up to Athenian control um, and the destruction of the Persian navy at Macale really solidifies that Athens, with its 200-ship navy, is the preeminent power in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and because hostilities don't end when you know we you know historians draw the line between the second 
Greek War and the wars of the Delian League, there's a constant barrage for almost 20 years of fighting against the Persian Navy, and they're never able to build up their strength again. So that's the big loss, is that they can't control trade and naval movements in the Mediterranean the way they used to. Yeah, they definitely lost um, a lot of that, that sort of impact. And I mean, that was a lot firmer, uh, sorry, a lot firmer um, held before the invasions took place. But for the, the empire itself, I mean, like you said, it was on, this is on the fringes, like the, the Western fringes of the empire. So back in, I guess, Persian royal court and within the heart of the empire, how much did this play perhaps on like a prestige level? Um, did the empire, was it affected in its stability in any way because of what was happening over on the West? The biggest political fallout for Xerxes seems to be a rebellion that Herodotus describes from his brother. Um, and this is someone Herodotus calls Mesistes. There's some debate whether or not that's his actual name or a title. Um, though there's also another Persian that Herodotus calls Mesistius, so it sounds like it probably could be a name. Um, and Mesistes was the satrap of Bactria, um, and he was present at Macale. Uh, and some, t you know, Herodotus chalks everything up to Xerxes sleeping with his wife, but yeah, you know, it's also in the aftermath of these big defeats that Mesistes was there to witness, and according to some theories. His, this was actually his title, so he would have been kind of the heir apparent if something were to happen to Xerxes. Um, so he leads a rebellion, and it's put down fairly quickly, um, but it seems plausible that that rebellion was motivated by, you know, a suggestion that Xerxes was weak after the defeats in Greece. Uh, but like I said, there are, you know, at least three groups that appear for the first time in Xerxes' reign. So he was doing things and he proved military prowess on a number of other occasions. Um, you know, he put down rebellions at the outset, he and apparently added new territory in the east. So this wasn't ultimately a huge PR failure for Xerxes. Um, something I do want to point out though is that you know, in the ancient world, it was really easy for the king to control the narrative. Um, and in that same XPH Diva inscription, Xerxes lists all of the people who are under his control, including, kind of tellingly, the Greeks, those who dwell on this side of the sea, so that's the ones like the Ionians and the Greeks who live in the Persian Empire, and those who dwell across the sea. So he's kind of inferring, without directly stating, or making a monument about it, that he controls the Greeks in mainland Greece, whether or not that was actually the case. Um, and based on kind of the time period when he was building at Persepolis and how this uh, inscription talks about uh, the events where he put down a rebellion, it might be that he actually commissioned it before he even left. So this might be him saying, I'm going to have taken them over whether or not I'm successful or not. Um, and, you know, never really acknowledging those defeats, which would be something his father did too. Um, Herodotus describes Darius invading uh, European Scythia and being led on a wild goose chase through modern Ukraine. But Darius went to his grave claiming that he ruled the Scythians on the far side of the sea. but. Ultimately, Xerxes stopped referring to that group in his inscriptions. You know, it kind of said, Dad, you, it didn't work. So it kind of feels like the same thing is happening with Xerxes' monuments. Yeah, I, I also wondered whether um, Xerxes could, I guess, mitigate some of the fallout by ignoring, I guess, what the initial objectives were and what they were trying to achieve, but then presenting what they had achieved. I mean, he could claim to have paid Athens back, but they, they captured Athens and burnt it twice. Um, and that was, I guess, one of the major objectives of the first invasion to take place was to, to punish Athens in their revolt. I mean, he also had other things like uh, the defeat at Thermopylae, uh, 
where they were actually able to kill a a, uh, a Greek king, you know, uh, Leonidas at, at, at Thermopylae. So there were definitely prestigious aspects they could point to as being successful in the theatre while diverting away what had not gone right. Right. And, you know, it was always probably worth pointing out that the war wasn't over. You know, this uh, conflict continued pretty much continuously into the 460s uh, with the Athenians, you know, taking territory in Ionia and going back and forth. And even though the Persians never really posed an offensive threat after like the mid 460s, you know, the Persian kings could always claim, well, we're still fighting the Greeks. We're going to take it eventually. You know, and I, that goes on until I think it's 439 when the Athenians finally sign a treaty with Artaxerxes I, Xerxes' son. So this is, this is a multi-generational conflict on both sides. Yeah. Um, so Xerxes never ran out of ammunition to say that, oh, he was still going to get them. Yeah. And I guess perhaps we could just finish off with, I guess, more of a, a look down the future of what uh, the, Greek and, the, the Greek and Persian wars, like the effect they had in Persia as time went on. I mean, like you said, it's they lost control of uh, a lot of parts of the West, but they would still... Persia would still have a major role in Greek affairs with the interactions that would take place. I mean, especially when it comes down to uh, funding different sides, which would come up in the, the Peloponnesian War. But I guess just briefly, I mean, we we both haven't um, covered this sort of area in our in our series yet. But just a, a I guess a, a brief rundown of further down the track, what was happening because of um, the Greek and Persian Wars, right? I think, you know, this might be a somewhat controversial opinion in the world of Persian studies, but I think it is possible to draw a direct line from some of the consequences of the second invasion of Greece straight to Alexander the Great conquering the Persian Empire. Um, yeah. After over 30 years of nonstop war between Persia and Athens, they finally signed this peace treaty uh, called the Treaty of Kalais, and this establishes, you know, some principles of interaction between the Greek world and the Persians that are ultimately broken, and there are more wars. But the important part is that Artaxerxes I shifted to a policy of uh, empowering the governors, the satraps in Anatolia, so in places like Lydia and Phrygia and um, uh, Cilicia and those border regions and giving them basically carte blanche to do whatever they want to influence Greek politics and keep the Greeks from starting the war up again or, you know, being able to take more Persian territory um, and giving them the, abil the ability to take the Ionian cities back. Well, this ultimately led to the, you know, influence in the Peloponnesian War, where the Persians pumped tons and tons of money into Greece uh, because they were hiring mercenaries like crazy on both sides. Um, and this, at the end of the Peloponnesian War, left a bunch of Greek mercenaries with nothing to do but look for more jobs. Um, and this Persian prince named Cyrus the Younger in a position of immense power where he had been in charge of managing uh, Persian affairs in Greece for a few years. So he hires a bunch of these Greek mercenaries and starts rebellion against his brother, which ultimately doesn't work. But this ongoing policy of really strong local governors with their own armies is obviously starting to cause problems. And the king at the time, Artaxerxes II, doesn't do a whole lot about it, but it remains an issue and causes rebellions throughout his reign. So his son, Artaxerxes III, when he takes power, he strips all of the power away from these satraps. You know, they don't get to have their own armies anymore. They don't get to mint their own coins anymore. Um, but then when Artaxerxes III is assassinated, it, it's his youngest son who's still a kid who's put on the throne. And there's this new guy in Greece who's been doing all sorts of things and stirring up trouble. His name's Philip of Macedon. And he invades Persian territory while this kid, Artaxerxes IV, is on the throne. Um, 
Artaxerxes IV is ultimately assassinated by the same guy who killed his dad. And while there's still a Macedonian army just sitting in uh, eastern or in western Anatolia, um, and that's how Darius III, the last Persian king, comes to power. But by huge coincidence, Darius III comes to power right at the same time that Philip of Macedon is assassinated himself. So Darius marches in with a Persian army and easily defeats these Macedonian people who seem to be really disorganized and not know what they're doing. And the Persians are able to chalk up the early Macedonian successes to, well, we had a kid on the throne and there had just been a couple of assassinations, so we were disorganized, but now everything's fine. And nobody is ready when Alexander the Great uh, becomes king of Macedon and suddenly invades Persian territory. Um, but it's all, it all goes straight back to Artaxerxes III disempowering the Western satraps who had become too powerful on account of having to deal with the fallout of the invasion from Greece. Yeah, so it all, it all ends up feeding into itself somewhere along the lines. Exactly. I mean, it's not, not a direct connection, but it just as it unfolds over time. Uh, I think it would be interesting um, to hear what you come up with as you you progress with your series on on uh, those issues as well. But um, I think we'll leave uh, things there. I think we've gone on for some time now, and um, I think we've covered everything I was looking at uh, talking to you about today. So that was good. So I'd like to thank you for coming on and um, sharing your knowledge of. Uh, Persia with us, uh, Trevor. It was good to have you on. Of course. And before we do leave, can you let everyone know where they can find you and your podcast? Right. Uh, well, you can always find me wherever you happen to be listening to this one, uh, even if that's on Patreon, because I'm over there at uh, slash History of Persia. But if you want to find me specifically, it's historyofpersiapodcast.com or uh, History of Persia podcast on Facebook and Instagram, and it's just History of Persia if you look for me on Twitter. All right, so right. well, thanks again, Trevor, and I'm sure we'll probably have a few more interactions along the way as we continue our series, so. No doubt, I, I hope eventually we can uh, swap this around and maybe have you tell me about the Peloponnesian War. <laughs> for sure, we'll, um, I will be looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, thank you, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. And um, I'll see you for uh, our next episode. I hope you enjoyed my talk with Trevor Cully. I really feel like a lot of the points I made last episode were fleshed out in greater detail. As the series continues forward, I'm sure there will be more appearances from Trevor when we look at Persia's involvement in Greek affairs through the Peloponnesian War. I have one more episode left that will be focusing on the Greek and Persian Wars, which we'll be looking at them in their entirety. This is to tie all the past episodes together and to act as a refresher to jog our memories before we move forward. Though for our next episode release, I'm going to put out an interview episode. I've just spoken to the author, Mark Adams, who wrote the book Meet Me in Atlantis. We recorded an interview that looks at his time researching and writing the book. He had traveled around the Mediterranean meeting with many people who'd put Atlantis theories forward, and he wrote about the quest for the lost city that so many people had become addicted to. It becomes not only an account of the tale of Atlantis, but a story of the people trying to find the lost city. In addition to releasing this interview, I will also be releasing a teaser for my latest bonus episode over on Patreon, the Atlantis Minoan Connection. This episode is what led me to arranging an interview with Mark Adams, as I had been rereading his book, Meet Me in Atlantis. So I hope you look forward to our little digression to have some fun with the tale of Atlantis. Thank you to everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all of those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon in other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me to grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support in helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting underscore Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time for my interview with Mark Adams. <laughs>